Hey guys, welcome back to Star Wars Timeline. My name is Ben. Today I'm happy to welcome back Meg at Mac Reviews. This is our very first podcast this year. I hope we get to do many more. Today we're talking about the giant topic, but before I introduce it, uh, Meg, please say hello. Uh, uh, remind our audience uh, what your channel is all about and what kind of books you review. Yeah, hi. My name is Meg. Um, I both read new Star Wars books like the High Republic stuff, but mostly my channel is about rereading and reviewing the old Star Wars Legends books. So back last year in 2021, I reread the New Jedi Order books. And then this year for 2022, I am rereading the prequels era novels from 1999 to 2005. Nice. This is quite a project. And this is the topic of our conversation today the new Jedi Order. This is a massive undertaking that took place from uh, 1999 into 2003 and spanned over 19 books, plus ebooks, plus novellas. Obviously, I'm doing an intro for those of you guys who may be hearing it for the first time. We just vaguely heard about this initiative, which was part of Star Wars Legends as of 2014. Of course, it was rebranded. It's no longer of part of current canon. But we don't care, Meg. You and I, we're Star Wars fans. It's all Star Wars books uh, to us. And, you know, I was so interested in hearing what you had to say about individual books that I said, you know what? Time for another podcast. I love the way that you do your reviews, the way that you analyze and pay attention to story arcs and characters. Guys, for those of you who are seeing Meg with me here, my not the first time guest, for the first time, Please go check out her YouTube page. The way that she delves into like Star Wars reviews is really, really awesome. If you think I know anything about my Star Wars, please, by all means, just <laughs> check out Meg. She is the real deal here. She knows her stuff inside out. But anyway, uh, you know, I really wanted to touch upon this because New Jedi Order, you seem to be very, very passionate about it as well as I, you know, it's... Once again, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Within the short four years, they were able to crank out 19 books that fans are talking about to this day, right? And once again, briefly, just to give you guys the gist what it's all about, it's portraying the events which took place from 21 to 25 years after the events of the original trilogy. And we see Luke Skywalker in full swing, restoring the New Jedi Order. And here we're blasted with a brand new enemy, these intergalactic invaders, the Yuuzhan Vong, and we have 19 books to cover. Meg, I wanted to start us off with just general conversation about New Jedi Order. And then as a preface to our future podcast, I think it's the most vital book to talk about. It's the first one. It's the sales <laughs> pitch. It's the introductory. It, it will either make it or break it to any readers who are trying to get into this new series after they read the first book. My first question to you is, how did you first get into the New Jedi Order? Well, back when when it was first released, this was a huge initiative on Del Rey and Lucasfilm's part. Yeah. There was like straight up a commercial that I believe aired on the Sci-Fi Channel. You know that this was the next installment in the Star Wars saga, and mm -hmm. you know it was going to be a galaxy at war. It was going to be like the darkest that the storyline had ever been. And um, because coming out of the Bantam era books, fans were feeling like there weren't consequences for things. And that yeah. basically, you know, you'd read a trilogy and then it would reset and you'd read the next one. So you'd read a trilogy and then you'd read the next one and things would have just reset. So it was like, there were a few character deaths but nothing major and so with yeah. the new jedi order they were wanting it to right from the get-go right from vector prime for you to be like this is serious this is real mm -hmm. uh, so there was like this big marketing push for it you know the commercial and even and mark it, hamill uh, 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 borrowed like his likeness to the first book right he appears on the cover and i just yeah. read up as i was writing out you know our topics for today that he was also part of this which i didn't know before today that he also advertised there was like some kind of campaign where it was like a questionnaire where there's like some kind of uh featurette where he mentions this book and he talks about that it's going to be this huge new initiative so yeah i just wanted to kind of like get the gist of were you like aware of it or just did you go completely blind and like just pick up a book and like hey i guess this is something uh, next for me to read but were you reading any other star wars book at the time that you remember of 
Yeah, so I first got into Star Wars books in 1997 with the release of the special edition trilogy. Mm -hmm. I saw it. I wanted to know what happened next. And fortunately, I had a cousin who was older than me who was like, there's books. So I had read the Thrawn trilogy and the Hand of Thrawn duology, the Jedi Academy trilogy. And so I'd gotten to the point where if there were an, as a new Star Wars book coming out, I would go to my library and I would say, hey, you got that new Star Wars book. And they would you know, either put me on a list or give it to me. Mm -hmm. So I knew that Vector Prime was going to be big, the start of something new. I don't think I quite knew what it had in store for me, um, which I think for a lot of people, if approaching Vector Prime for the first time, unspoiled is is an absolute roller coaster of a mm -hmm. ride. Yeah, you know, and it's yeah. Who could have thought, right, that within the span of four years we'll get nineteen books? Because obviously, it's it's a business, and they need to sell books. They need to make sure that audience stays engaged, and mm -hmm. that's basically what, what you know outlines the success. Same with, with what's happening with the High Republic books here. It depends where they you know, announcing phases and more books yeah. and more authors are being announced, but it all rides on how popular it is. And the fans are not, you know, into it. Well, apparently the new Jedi order was 19 books popular. So pretty much speaks <laughs> to its popularity. The way that I discovered the books, I started about the same time that you are in like 97, 98. I was like three mm -hmm. years in the country. My English was like literally next to non-existent. I was like, oh, like with well, the translator <laughs> trying to figure this out. But I, I ran into the bookstore and I saw this cover Right. Obviously, we recognize Luke Skywalker's face. This is actually my original one. Like, I tried to keep it in a clean uh, condition. But I saw this. I'm like, hold on. What the heck? It has like a Star Wars logo on it, but like the character designs and an aged look. Like, what is happening? Yeah. And I, I was already familiar with a couple of books like yourself. I read the uh, Jedi Academy trilogy, the Thrawn trilogy, a couple of books in between. I had no clue what it was all about. I didn't know how many books there are. I didn't know there was a whole advertising campaign. I did not know at all what to expect. And I think that for me, it was the biggest benefit. And it was a very interesting perspective where, you know, in the modern age where people, you can go to Facebook group and people recommend you 25,000 books in like 20 minutes and it'll right. spoil things to you potentially. And there's shows to watch and there's more books and there's Disney plus animation. There's so much stuff. We're either uh, oversaturated with things it was just overabundance of information. It kind of spoils things for you. I feel like our generation, the way it has been privileged, is like, oh, there is internet. You push a button and you can like type a few. Wikipedia wasn't even around, right? No. And, and like basically you had to go to a bookstore and like it was a word of mouth. You had to talk to people. You had to ask questions. Fortunately, I had a friend who knew a lot about Star Wars. Like, hey, Ben, did you know there's books? But anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Uh, it's quite a commitment. So, Meg, encompassing first couple of books that you've read maybe not necessarily the entire you know franchise but the first couple of books you entered you started reading this new thing what was your overall impression i remember i was well vector prime really was so shocking to me and mm. that i had to keep reading because it was like where where are they going to go from there and Basically, at that point in time, the hardcover books were, I, I couldn't afford them. I was a teenager, but I could afford the paperbacks. And one of the, I don't know, the joys of the New Jedi Order was there was a hardcover release each year, but there was, you know, maybe up to four paperback releases as well. And I could get those. I could go in. And so I have memories of like the second book of the Dark Tide mm -hmm. duology, which is the third book in the series. I remember we were on a family vacation in Vancouver. I got it from a bookstore. I was reading it. And I remember like leaving notes to myself in nice. parts like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, uh, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. It was quite a shocker to me too, because I didn't know what to expect. And it just felt the texture of it, the feel like the setting. The, the scene descriptions, even like the small details like the characters, you know, pro style was so different from Bantam era. I would characterize <laughs> Bantam era as more like this beautifully naive fantasy adventure films of the 80s, where like it's clear cut good versus evil. It's clear right. cut, you know, heroes always win, kind of like a feel good hero wins a happy ending kind of like at the end. 
And this tried to take it into a whole new territory. And I think Legacy later on continues that trend where it's like more sober, dark sci-fi. At times, I would even say Legacy era would even qualify for like grim dark. It's just yes. too brutal and too dark. I'm like, hold on a second. Am I reading like Warhammer 40K or am I still reading Star Wars? It just felt very, very distinct. So it's interesting that you also had like quite a shocker feel for it. Uh, so I, we, I guess we're comparing notes here. I'm really curious, you know, how you felt about it. Would you compare the New Jedi Order to any other books that you read at the time, not necessarily Star Wars? Yeah, I I feel like I was always more of a fantasy reader or if I read science fiction it wasn't hard science fiction it was more like space opera and stuff so the new jedi order for me was one of the first it felt very like adult series where it wasn't like the bantam era it wasn't these fun space adventures it yeah. felt like things had consequences and our heroes were up against a foe that they didn't know anything about and they couldn't immediately win and yeah. i remember being yeah really surprised by that because a lot of what i'd read before then was i read lord of the rings and sure things go bad for them but everything ends happily it's still a classic and, tale yeah 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 and so a lot of like classic fantasy and more lighter sci-fi so the new jedi order was yeah, probably one of my first experiences of reading a like darker, more mature story. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, my first book that I ever read from Star Wars was uh, uh, True Said Bakura. And mm. um, for me, I kind of hesitated reading and starting getting to an American sci-fi because I wanted to be in a place where I read the top, the cream of the crop stuff first mm -hmm. and then get to like generic stuff later. But I couldn't discern. I didn't know the authors. I didn't understand the staples of what is considered generic, what is considered innovative and groundbreaking. And when I encountered this Shiri Rook, those uh, uh, lizard aliens and how like they extract your essence and put it in, in their weaponry, it was so mind blowing and new to me. I was like, you know what? I don't care what other people consider this, what professional critics say about these books. I'm in, I was invested. And the new Jedi Order comes around and starting with the Vector Prime, once again, I didn't have that much. I wasn't well read in sci-fi or fantasy, either one. And I didn't have a reference point how this would stand on the pedestal of like hardcore series science fiction. But I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm invested in this. This is touching me on a deeper level. This is impressing me. This is making me experience what I hardly ever experience in film. It's like a, yeah. for a movie to scare me or make me cry. That's an exceptional movie, right? But these books started doing it. And I was like, OK, I know I'm on the right track this feels right and i remember reading at the time starship troopers is it arthur c clark always oh i think that's robert Heinlein. i always mix yeah. up Heinlein and arthur c clark every every time but i was reading <laughs> starship troopers at the time i'm like yeah i kind of see little parallels well, obviously one book is like a uh, uh, commentary on uh, futurism and and war in the future like this kind of like autocratic slash nazi kind of regime where humanity has to adapt to kill off this enemy, we should start drawing a parallel with the Yuuzhan Vong later on, which we'll get into. But I was like, okay, I see that. I see that darkness. I see that hardcore sci-fi feel for it. Meg, let's talk about the author. So as far as I counted, the New Jedi Order featured 11 authors. We got famous heavy hitters like R.S. Salvatore, Michael Stackpole, James Lucino, Cassie Thiers, Tony, uh, Troy Denning, uh, Matthew Stover, and others. Did you feel that that ensemble of prominent authors benefited this kind of storytelling? I do, because I think I think there was a feeling for me of reading Vector Prime by Salvatore, and I wasn't familiar with his writing. I hadn't yeah. read any of his you know fantasy novels. But then the next duology is Michael A. Stackpole. I was very familiar with him because I'd read all the X-Wing books. So I felt like the authors, whether they were you know, old Star Wars regulars or new ones brought interesting things to the series. And actually some of my favorite books in the series were by authors who were completely new to the Star Wars universe. Like the, the three books by Greg Keyes were really interesting to me and made me 
want to look at what non-Star Wars books he had written, which is Mm -hmm. what happened a lot with Bantam was where I would first encounter an author through their Star Wars books and like Timothy Zahn and then go, oh, well, what what else has he written? And then move on to their original fiction from there. So it was a cool introduction for you, uh, uh, authors and their other works. Yeah, yeah. But I do think that, you know, each of them brought maybe a different interest to the books, but Mm -hmm. I felt like for the most part, like their styles worked well together. So you did feel like it was like one coherent uniform story, even though it's like it's nine different chapters. Obviously, you could tell when you go from book to book and when I listened to your your reviews and even my own reactions were as I was reading the books that each author excelled at different aspects. Obviously, yes. some authors are better at writing like space battles, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Other authors are uh, character driven, like, you know, uh, uh, Claudia Gray. Sorry, it just escaped me. <laughs> you know, they have different skill sets, but I just wanted to get your mind of like a compare note. So you did feel like it was one wholesome story, right? Yeah, I did. I felt like sometimes my issue was I felt like the continuity between books was a little shaky Mm -hmm. but a lot of that i was forgiving of knowing that yeah they wrote 19 books in four years this was we had email but you know you didn't have video conferencing or anything so i yeah i did feel like sometimes characters would rise in prominence in a book and then fall away for a few and you talk about that Mm -hmm. (laughs) I loved how you discussed that and you compare notes because, uh, you know, I've, it's been so long since I've read them. It would be quite a task for me to try to pull off those characters and read the individual arcs and then make comparisons. It would be like a project for me. But since you're okay. fresh, you were doing this whole reading. It was so fun for me going into your reviews and listening to your analysis, but also make that overture to the next book like hey but how does it stack up over here and i didn't like what they were doing with giant over there she kind of feels like this hey what, what what's up with leia's role diminished over here? i really enjoyed the progress here i, I think you should do like a super cut of all mm. of your a new jedi order maybe like not, not necessarily whole complete reviews but like excerpts here and there splice it all together. i think it would be such an invaluable tool for star wars fans yeah i think so especially because I felt like I obviously have my favorite characters who I am reading for. And so a lot of times in reviewing, I'm sort of tracking like, okay, where they are, where are they doing, how are they being used? Mm -hmm. Um, Which, you know, obviously there's some people reading it and they don't care anything about what Jaina Solo is doing, but I'm reading it and I'm like passionately interested in everything. Sure. So there was never a book that you felt like, or maybe like a prominent, prominent character that you feel like throw away or doesn't belong and it feels like a Thor thumb in within the like 19 books? Yeah, not any of the main characters. Mm-hmm. I felt like some of the minor characters were, especially it felt sometimes like a minor character would appear, you know, filling a certain role, be like yeah. an agitator in the Jedi Order. And then three books later, we'd have a, completely new minor character doing the same thing. And that would be one instance where I'd say, hey, like you should probably combine these people. I can't keep all <laughs> yeah. these Jedi straight. But I felt like for the main characters, I didn't feel like their story was ever unimportant or, you know, like something that could have been edited out from the plot. Um, even sometimes it was actually the opposite where I wish there was more attention to them. Yeah. But um, yeah, I did feel like all their story arcs went, you know, felt necessary to the story that was being told. Same here. And you know what? I probably I suspect that my level of English played into it where it, to this day, sometimes it's hard for me to understand aerial battles when they describe maneuvers mm-hmm. or even sometimes an exotic ship descriptions. Like I get the shapes, I understand the terminology, but it's still hard for me to grasp. And a lot of New Jedi Order when I was reading it, like what they were talking about, the Vong armor, the Phillips, the, the <laughs> staffs, Amphi staffs, all this stuff, because I didn't know I would probably get like 60, 70 percent of the book and the rest I didn't. It was so tiresome mm-hmm. to go back into physical translator sitting by your side at one point you know what you start doing when you're reading in a foreign language you start filling out the fantasy in your mind it's like um (laughs) sometimes you misread character names and that pronunciation stays with you throughout the years even when you learn the proper one like it doesn't matter 
that's what he he means to me that's what this particular scene means to me so it, you kind of get a sense of ownership a lot more because he had yeah. to complete the mental picture because you have a lack of understanding um meg the next question i want to we, we're going to start talking about vector property i just had a couple of questions mm -hmm. i really really was curious to get your thoughts on uh, you know, how, like before I do my reviews of the books, I like to have like hold the physical copy and I enjoy <laughs> highlighting the, the artists of the book and say like, hey, you know, he's not getting enough spotlight. I always name the, the artist of the book and I talk a little bit about this and then I get into the book. Going and shopping for Star Wars books in, also, it's like such an, it was such an experience for me. I was like, oh, I like this cover. Oh, look, you got, <laughs> finally, I get to see Lando Calrissian on this one. How did you feel about the covers of the New Jedi Order? I think they were very striking. I also think a lot of them were very, now looking at them feel very early 2000s to me. I think it's that mix of like the, the Photoshop elements. Um, my favorite ones now are the ones that look like art, like mm -hmm. the ones that look like drawings, more mm -hmm. so than the ones where I know it was like a photo collage with effects. But I remember at the time that they were, I would just like come into the bookstore and I would just be walking down the aisle and I could immediately see them like they had a very distinct style and it was a very distinct different style than the Bantam era books which had yeah. you know beautiful cover art by Drew Struzan and then these are like dark and mm -hmm. and gritty and and very colorful too. Yeah. I like the Heretic trilogy uh uh um covers they mm. are what i think are like early digital paintings so they are photoshop but they're not like character or actor montages like spliced yeah. into the beach i don't like that like for example i think was it trader the one that has Gina on the cover is like super cgi like it oh, felt like a, a oh. video game screenshot i'm like what the heck is this but the <laughs> heretic trilogy even though it's like digitally painted, it is so on point. It's like the poses are so dynamic. And just seeing Luke with like crop top hair, probably yeah. like in his somewhere like in his late to mid 40s, he just looked raw. I'm like, oh man, I'm into this. It just made you want to pick up the book and start reading immediately. Um, but then we had also the Japanese versions of those covers. Yes. We had it's, it's Yoshi Nagano Japanese art. I'm curious, were you aware of those covers? at the time or was it like a discovery later on that was definitely a discovery later on i think starting in the year 2000 i became much more aware of the internet and mm -hmm. i got an account on um the force.net um yes, message <laughs> <laughs> yes. And i remember there someone posting scans of the covers but it wasn't at the time that the books were released it was afterwards but a i bit later i would say I, Yes, I loved like getting to see all the different characters, getting to see one of the things I love most is that it seemed like on the covers of the New Jedi Order books, no one remembered that Leia had her head shaved in, yeah. in balance point. But the Japanese covers, it, it showed a progression of her hair like slowly growing out that I thought was really well done. And the way that Tsuyoshi Nagano does like likenesses like Harrison Ford, Mark yeah. Hamill, and they're clearly not photographs that he's like superimposing on a on artwork and just painting over it. This is like he does angles that are non-existent and stuff like yeah. that. It's so cool that not only you're bringing him up as well, but like you're, you're citing the, the force.net. Oh my God, this is crazy. I remember like early college years, like the force.net, I'm going for my next uh, review. After I finished the book, I would go and check out. They, usually they had several authors, uh, readers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, put their up their reviews sometimes. Oh, yeah, but... it'd be like the good, the bad, and, and the, oh, like the ugly or something. Yeah. It'd be like a picture of Jabba. <laughs> That's so awesome. Like, I'm, I'm really happy that you are you were like also tapped into that uh, resource. Um, before readers would start getting into the new Jedi order, right? Somebody's let's assume somebody's watching this wonderful podcast, like, oh, you know, Meg knows a lot, Ben knows a lot. I think I'm going to start reading new Jedi order today. Do you feel that there's a couple of books that people absolutely must get under their belt as essential reading before jumping into the new Jedi order to get the most out of the story? Yeah, I feel like Vector Prime does a fairly good job of introducing you to characters. I mm -hmm. would say, especially if people are interested in reading the books that came before, I would say 
the Thrawn trilogy and the Jedi Academy trilogy are probably very important because the Thrawn trilogy, mm -hmm. it, you know, introduces Mara Jade, introduces the idea that Han and Leia are married and have, you know, expecting children. And then the Jedi Academy trilogy with how it, you know, sets up Luke as the founder of the next Jedi Order yeah. and uh, Kip or Kip Durin's character, since he's such a, he's not a main character in Vector Prime, but he is sort of an important character to know because he's very antagonistic towards Luke. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe if people were interested in the solo kids, maybe the Corellian trilogy as well, because mm -hmm. I don't think that really plays much of a role in the new Jedi Order other than the, you know, center point station and in the yeah. Corellian system. But it is one of your first looks at the solo kids as the characters in their own rights. Yeah, I think from the Corellian trilogy, you're absolutely right. It felt like more like a localized conflict and more like solo family beef from Han's mm -hmm. side, obviously, you know, his, his uh, cousin or, or his brother, right? Was it his brother? Oh, his cousin. His cousin, that's right. <laughs> And uh, uh, but the center point station becomes more prominent during the legacy era. But you know what? I would throw into that line. First of all, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, Thrawn and Jedi Academy trilogies are a must. But mm -hmm. I would also add to that list the Young Jedi Knight series by Kevin J. Anderson. Oh, yeah. Learning the early years of Jason and Jaina, I, I felt they made such a contribution to who Jason later becomes. It just builds that crazy arc what the Yuzang Vong War does to Jason, what the legacy era does to him. You see that progression and that decline of a character like in such a meaningful way. Like I felt like I lived with that characters for many years. You know what I mean? It's like, oh man, it's like, it, it, you really feel for it, especially a climatic book of the legacy era. I'm like, oh my God, that's great. And one aspect, I don't know why, I guess I'm nitpicking, but mm -hmm. I do want fans to understand the concept of political space of the galaxy post episode six, like, I mean, like right away that there is still Imperial remnant, even before yeah. Thrawn arrives to the scene, that there is these moths that are vying for power. They're trying to one up each other. I felt the truce of Ed Bakura sets up that tone very well of trying to help the reader understand like what is going on there. Okay. The, the galaxy is divided up into these areas. There's unknown regions of space. Is it that area from which the Vong invade? I don't remember. I think it's the opposite side of the map. So it's sort of like when you're looking at yeah. the galaxy, if, I mean, if you could put the galaxy on a map, yeah. that the Bakura is sort of the western part and the Vuln invade, it's like the northeast. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I gathered my, my things. I'm trying like, to envision the yeah. mental. Guys, if you want all the extra details and like the sharp info on what's and what, Please go check out Meg's channel. <laughs> I'm clearly not the guy for the task. But <laughs> let's jump into talking about Vectum Prime because, you know, this is the sales pitch. This is like a pilot of a series. It, I, I believe, like, I just watched the first episode of, you know, The Wheel of Time. Everything mm -hmm. rides on the first episode. Yeah, sometimes, you know, show might, might steer the course a little bit, try to improve a couple of things here and there. But it's pretty much in today's industry where an entire season is filmed. And then thrown on these uh, streaming uh, channels, the show rides or dies in the first episode. That's why I think it's very important that we touch upon you know, the, you know, the, the Vector Prime first. And then for those of you guys who are interested in our future podcast, we'll probably start tackling two or maybe three books at a time. Meg, whatever makes sense to you and I, you know, maybe you will be my uh, supporting handle. Like you, you will be like bring all the extra detail. It's all fresh in your memory. We'll take it from there. Anyway, Vector Prime, here we go. Looking back at in retrospect, now that you know the whole, you know, New Jedi Order series, now we live in this whole new Star Wars environment. How do you feel about Vector Prime? I think it's a good introduction to the series. I also think it's a very different book than the rest of the books in the series. It has like I guess the best way to describe it is a tone unlike any of the other Star Wars books. And I think part of that is because so much of the book is devoted to the, these completely new characters who are scientists on a station on Belkadin who are monitoring the, I guess, the edge of the galaxy. And then these, you know, unknown invaders. Mm -hmm. 
And then also just the solo kids who are now teenagers, they're, I guess, not quite Jedi Knights yet because they're training with their aunt and uncle, but they're much more feeling like people than they were when they were younger. Yeah. So, yeah, it does have a really different feel to me. And that may also be, you know, coming off the Bantam era books and then Vector Prime is just like a complete change of pace. So the mm -hmm. tone of the book is like a lot different than any of the other books. Did you feel that the conflict was enough, the admission prize? Did it pack enough punch to like punch you in the gut and be like, oh my God, I don't know where it's going to go from there. Or did it feel like, well, I guess it's a decent enough intro. It's like it's piqued my interest. Let me see what else it has to offer. Like which one of these two extremities was it? Yeah, I think that for me, it was a big hook. I think with the later half of the new jedi order series i start to get a little tired with the villains but the introduction to we we got to them here is it was sort of like giving you little snippets of information but you still don't have the full picture because right. obviously they're holding a lot of stuff back so like the balcony scenes a lot of those felt like like horror to me because it's it's almost like one of those yeah. one of those movies where you know there's a bunch of teenagers and they're and they're locked in a cabin with someone who's a killer mm -hmm. and yeah so knowing from the start that like one of those scientists is like has infiltrated them and knowing that he's there to make sure no one gets out the word when yeah. this use involved advance force enters mm -hmm. um like those are very suspenseful for me those scenes and then um just some of the stuff that happens to our main characters was just really i don't want to spoil anything but really <laughs> shocking to me like yeah. obviously did not see it coming and it you know was was devastating <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, let's trace just a little bit for, for, you know, listeners who either read the books or are new to this, just as a reference point, who do you feel Luke Skywalker is as a character going into the prime book? What is like this, his state of mind? Yeah. So Luke in the Bantam era books, it seemed like he made a lot of bad decisions. And a lot of those stem from what he did in the Dark Empire comic, which was basically uh, very reminiscent of Rise of Skywalker. The Emperor was able to transfer his essence into a clone. And so Luke purposefully goes to the dark side to stop him. Mm -hmm. And it's only the love of his sister that's able to pull him back. So sort of as a consequence of what he did, Luke sort of jumps into things in the Bantam era and they don't always go well for him. So at the end of the Hand of Thrawn duology by Timothy Zahn, it seemed like Luke had realized that he needed to take a less active approach, that he needed yeah. to open himself up more to the force as guidance rather than, you know, the force uh, motivating his actions and driving him into these battles. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like as Vector Prime opens, Luke is very cautious about the future of the Jedi Order and how he wants them to act. And that's not going over well with some of the other Jedi that he's taught over the years. Yeah, I think a little bit of what you're describing uh, sounds more like Luke from The Last Jedi. <gasps> Surprise! <laughs> but the, the less proactive and more kind of like brooding and, and meditative kind of Luke Skywalker. I felt that Children of the Jedi, first of all, I don't understand why the book gets all the hate to this day. I love it. It's one of my favorite Star Wars books. And second of all, I felt that book was one of the prime examples where Luke was put through this meat grinder, both physically and emotionally, and through the Throne trilogy, and then the Throne, the Hand of Throne duology, before we get into the Vong conflict, before we get into Vector Prime. I felt that Luke was seasoned enough to begin to understand the larger play of the force upon the galaxy and say like, look, I am new here. I have these students. I have made a promise to my master that I will bring back. I will restore the Jedi order. But uh, um, I have to tread carefully here. I have to understand that this thing is larger than I am. And my understanding of it is like over here. 
and you know that reverence for the force and that understanding that he's going blind into this new conflict and to be honest with you i was listening to what you were saying about luke's actions throughout the story throughout the journey and it made perfect sense to me uh that um sorry can you hear this it is like a beeping yeah a little beep oh, man. <laughs> never mind guys we'll keep going <laughs> we'll soldier through okay it's tough it was tough for luke too it's gonna be tough for us no but you know the idea is that the way that he hesitates and like you were frustrated with him what he was doing i was frustrated too but for me from the narrative standpoint it made so much sense because it's like so what did i do i'm everybody all other jedi are looking up to me unlike kip duran who thinks like he knows everything and obviously we know where his arc is going to take him how he get him and his x-wing uh wings get humbled in the same very book but that's besides the point right now luke is the guy who's like okay i have to like walk carefully here and i i, I was so invested how this 19 book journey will transform him and it did and that continues mm -hmm. on into the legacy era as well um let's switch gears a little bit here from our favorite heroes and go to the baddies and talk about the vong what is your we had some powerful powerful introduction through, through our the spy nomenor we mm -hmm. had our the warrior from the Protariat Vong cast of warriors Yominkar, and you have all we're meeting all these guys. What was your first reaction, your first response to the moment you start reading about them? Yeah, I remember I found them so strange. And I think part of that is the the biotechnology they use, that they were just completely foreign to anything else I had seen in Star Wars up to that point. And I found them it was definitely, I wanted to know more. I'm always that kind of reader who's like, okay, just tell me everything about them. But Vector Prime doesn't do that. It just sort of like slowly doles out information. And you're like, what was, what's their, what's their plan? Like, what are they doing? What's their tech? Like everything yeah. is a mystery. And I think it works really well for the reader because for our heroes too, like everything they encounter with the Vong, they don't know how to handle i i love mara's fight against the warrior yeoman car where you know she she's like yeah okay i i know how to fight and then but she's fighting someone who has like weapons she's never seen before uses them in ways she's never seen before and she's able to defeat him but she's like that was hard <laughs> yeah because uh, you know ill or not and we will talk about uh, mara's illness you know you you kind of like jump start my next uh, segue topic where i did want to talk about the battle at the balkadan you know the the poisoning slash terraforming of balkadan was unlike anything i've read before and i was like yeah. second guessing myself like hey is is this an entirely new concept in sci-fi literature or was this done somewhere like in pulp era 20s and 30s that somebody's excavating and reinventing belkadon felt so real so dystopian so scary and for me believe it or not the main hook of this book was nomenor mm. i mean the way this dude comes out and he shuts this thing and it's like how ruthless he is he's not a ruthless warrior we understand that he's a oh. coward but he's a ruthless believer into what needs to be accomplished first of all he's very cunning he's highly intelligent and in that sense he's very ruthless i'm like oh and like you you were describing Matt, like bit by bit they're slowly unveiling this character with so much this mounting tension and I'm like i want more next book i want more uh, more no manor next book i want more no manor give me more give me more. like you got so invested into it um and mara's sickness too it felt like where is it coming from like i felt like i missed a book or two right you had to like second guess yourself like hey is it something entirely new what's happening here and even though they show the first signs of illness right she's not really at the peak of it i'm like she should have been able to take down this like faceless alien like what's up she like she barely could take tackle him luke had to run to her rescue right if i remember correctly yeah with mara when i was reading vector prime i felt like i was missing something and i almost wanted to google it and be like is there is there like a comic i'm missing like mm -hmm. meter and jaina's training you know she's training jaina but she's ill and she's worried about her ability to have children and i'm like where's this coming from like a lot of vector prime felt like explaining 
you know, what had come before. But then some bits felt like we were just thrown into the middle of the action. And it's like, as the story progresses, that we learn more. And Mara's illness was one of those bits where it's just thrown at us. And I'm like, wait, uh, when did she get sick? How long has she been sick? Yeah. Well, I think when Lawrence Cashden and J.J. Abrams were rewriting the script to The Force Awakens, one of Lawrence's Cashden's advice was like, look, trust in the audience, throw them in the middle of action and give them the story the way that episode four presented. But basically what they teach you in film school when you study storytelling is that you tell audience on screen the best part of the story towards the end. And you tell via exposition scenes or via whatever is happening as the picture is moving along, quick ex expo, you explain what's happening, but take them on the ride. And where I felt that Force Awakens was generally an enjoyable ride, like I enjoyed that movie, but some of the, those concepts kind of misfired because the yeah. trilogy as a whole, in retrospect, didn't deliver. But this book here, guys, once again, Vector Prime, it set up so many interesting nuances that worked against one another so well that by the end of this book, I'm like, gave me more. I'm hooked. I'm addicted. Where's the next freaking book? I want to read some more. And besides just the aliens themselves, Vong, another topic I want to touch upon is the Vong technology. We got these coral skippers, these living, breathing ships that die when they're being injured. We have these bio armor that is like sits on their uh, bodies and these amphistaffs that they use. They could be solid state or turn into these venomous snakes upon their will. You have these villips, right, that they put on their faces like, oh, this is so disgusting. And then you have yeah. world coordinators, which completely just blew my mind. I'm like, you have this giant brain that floats through the sky. It sits inside of a planet, but it controls the the fleets to the uh, like, what is it like a mind meld or what is it? Can you explain? Oh, yeah. It's almost like they none of the ships think for themselves. It's mm -hmm. like the, uh, the Yamisk, the the battle coordinator thinks for them. And like, that's how they're able to move in such, you know, perfect togetherness is because essentially there's just one one thing controlling everything. What was your favorite uh, technology from Vong? I'm curious. Oh, I really, I really like the Yamisk. I, I just love the like horror of when Danny and Miko first saw it. And it's just like, it's terrifying and it's disgusting. I also, I guess I liked the, the like the amphi staffs and the jelly and just like the way that makes them fight differently than our heroes that yeah they can you know change their weapon like is it a rope is it a spear is it like a sword and, and then the block a lightsaber right if i remember correctly. yeah yeah it's like mm -hmm. because <laughs> the long are supposedly they're devoid of the force a right they're like the jedi can't sense them and the way they they the the bio armor is resilience to lightsabers and then the way the tactics they exploit are like the Jedi didn't expect it. It makes sense. They're intergalactic invaders, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like they have a fighting style that no one has encountered. So for the first few go arounds, it's just mm -hmm. you don't know what you're up against. Meg, I wanted to circle back to Danny Key because you were mentioning a couple of new uh, characters in this book that you really gravitated towards. How did you feel about her? So Danny was, she's one of the scientists we meet at we meet at Belkadin. She is a young woman, um, but has taken a leadership role because she has that potential. And she also has some kind, some level of force sensitivity. I like Danny. I like her, like her character and how strong she is. She did feel a little bit like too much of a damsel in distress at times mm -hmm. in Vector Prime, but Fortunately, later books of the series, like they don't they don't do that again. Um, she was like, yeah, a fun character to encounter because, you know, we always be politicians and and Jedi. But to meet a scientist, you know, they're they're not usually a key player. In they get the downplayed in Star Wars. Yeah. You know, with her. I think Belkadon was one of the most enjoyable scenes in, in reading Star Wars books in general for me, mm -hmm. because A, it was easy for me to uh, uh, visually conceptualize. I understood mm -hmm. what's, what was happening. The How slowly the vegetation went from this 
one place to another place. And then just yeah. when you thought the world is dead, you realize by the end, the mind blowing thing is like, no, 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 it's not dying. It's terraforming. They're transforming. Yeah. They're, and they're it, it kind of was a literal interpretation of what the Vong are about to unleash on this galaxy. Yeah. They're like these leeches. They're just going to crawl on top of this galaxy and just take over. Remember what they do later on? We'll touch upon course. And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, who was thinking this stuff up? I'm like, am I? Doing, and, you know, because you were like a little bit frustrated because you're so excited about this book, but you, you don't have a friend or anyone else to talk about this. And just yeah. to compare your thoughts, and it's like, are you feeling what I'm feeling? Like, what the heck? This is crazy, right? So Danny Key was just such a gentle and interesting kind of like an a, innocent youth whose innocent is being violated by this invasion and obviously she goes through so much toil throughout the the uh, 19 books that by the end of it i thought she becomes a a character of her own but i wanted to also get your thoughts on that um now we can't talk about vector prime without talking the falling moon at serpentine yes the the catastrophe the kind of like the end of the world first of all before it's happened to the d details Walk me through that general planet, that particular story arc in the book. What did it make you feel? Yeah, so basically it just seems like it's going to be a usual side quest because everyone gathers on Lando's planet of Dubrolon and Lando's yeah. like, oh, by the way, I need someone to run an errand for me. So Han and his son Anakin and Chewie take off to Cern Padal. They're just going to like pick stuff up. And they get there and find that like, it's just chaos. Everyone's running around screaming and they realize that the moon is a lot closer in orbit than it should be. So they slowly realize that there's something on the planet that's drawing the moon closer. They destroy that. They don't know what it is. It's used in Vuln Biotech, but at this point they don't know what it is, but it's too late. Like the orbit has already degraded. The moon's gonna crash into certain pedal. Everyone's gonna die. So at which point they like switch gears, and Han and Anakin or Chewie are just trying to get as many people off the planet as soon as possible. And of course, be you know Han Solo and Chewie, they just keep going until the very last moment. It's like this really nerve wracking scene where like Anakin's still there. He hasn't gotten to the Falcon. Chewie goes to get him and Han's like, oh, and yeah. like stuff is falling. They're like getting other people into the Falcon. And like the pivotal moment is that it's like almost moment zero when just everything's going to get destroyed. And Chewie makes the choice to throw Anakin into his father's arms and stay on the planet and meet his doom. He like turns to face the moon and he like raises his arms and is yelling at it. And it's like, oh, it's such a tense scene, but it's like such an emotional scene too, mm -hmm. because obviously Han's reaction is he's- Betrayal. With complete betrayal mm -hmm. that, you know, his friend would, choose to exchange his life for his sons and you know to just stay behind like that and knowing that it's his death and also that anakin han's yelling turn back around turn back around turn back around and get him and anakin because of the force knows that if he does that everyone's gonna die and so he makes the hard choice to 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 leave yeah. so you know han sees chewie's last moments and yeah. blames Anakin for it and yeah it's the start of like all this tension and drama within the solo family that's the sauce that makes stories interesting he's like oh yeah. you're, you're you're looking for a happy ending here how about how about we pit a father against son that's gonna try to take us through several books later right and how Han is I loved how they dealt with Han's dealing with Chewie's death in the next yeah. couple of books where to because Here's Han's family and Leia and the kids. It's obvious, it's family, it's your bloodline. But here is Chewie. Yeah. He, like, he, you, he's your boy, like you started with him. And how did, you, how did you feel that you will be reading the rest of Star Wars book forever and ever, because who knew Disney would buy it, that we'll never see Chewie again, at least in that time frame, in, the, in that chronology? 
it was it was so hard. I remember getting to the end of the Cern Fidel scenes and just having to put the book down and be like, and having to do something for a while, but then of course wanting to know what happened next and picking it back up. Chewie wasn't always a pivotal character in the Bantam era books, mostly because I think a lot of people like didn't didn't really know how to write him or didn't mm -hmm. want to write him, but just that loss. And knowing that you'll never see Chewie again, you know, unless they go earlier in the time that he's just gone, irrevocably gone. It really made Vector Prime feel like, yeah, like no one was safe, that you couldn't trust that everything would turn out all right, because look what happened. They dropped a moon on Chewie and now Han is never the same and his family's never the same. They finally start to make hard choices and I applaud them. And I, I'm pretty sure this is going to, I mean, this is already happening in the High Republic. They're kind of like taking notes. I'm pretty sure that in one way or another, New Jedi Order has inspired, you know, yeah. this. But I remember for me, reading that particular scene where like Chewie's standing there in defiance and this moon is like landing literally on top of him. I'm like, yes, gangster. That's the way <laughs> that you part with the favorite character. You give yeah. him the ultimate punchline. It doesn't have to be him versus like insurmountable odds in terms it's odds in terms of like enemies, bad guys or villainy. It's just this a, a force of nature. Yes, granted, Yu Zhang Wang are responsible for this atrocity, but it's still just like a force of nature. And he's making sacrifice to making sure his best friend kid survives. I'm like, yeah. what a beautiful way to part with a character. And you know what? I wasn't bitter or upset uh, that I'm not going to read about him anymore because at one point you have to say goodbye to your favorite character sooner or later. I'd rather it be sooner but done effectively mm -hmm. than. You know, sometimes when I talk about younger generation Star Wars readers and for some odd reason, they put like Star Wars Legends on the pedestal like it was pristine and perfect and all these new canon stuff is crap. I'm like, really? So you're going to tell me in the fate of the Jedi when Luke, Leia and Han are like in their 80s, bouncing off the walls, doing like backflips, like same crap they went through in their 20s is somehow perfect? Like, what are you talking about? They were clearly... And I'm not trying to bring the authors down. I'm not saying it was poor writing. I'm like three books in right now into Fate of the Jedi. I enjoy it. The sickness mm -hmm. was a little bit getting used to, but I'm enjoying it so far. But you could tell that there, there was um, a point where they were running into like just like obstacles and like lack of ideas and lack of inspiration. Like, uh, where else do we take it here? We don't really want to say goodbye to the most popular characters, the legacy cast, the trio. But where we take it next? And that signaled here what they did with Chewie. I'm like, all right, I'm in for the ride here. We're going to say goodbye. And I just want to read something here from Wikipedia real quick for anybody to break the spell, the illusion. If you guys think that Star Wars fandom was always united until Disney came and ruined everything for everyone, this is directly from Wikipedia. The book received much controversy for the death of Chewbacca. The first and only time a major film character has been killed off in the new non-canon Star Wars expanded universe, despite George Lucas's approval. The concept of killing such a character uh, was a decision the book editors have made who sent a list of characters they would like to kill to George Lucas, with George Lucas uh, mentioning that Skywalker was uh, on top of their list. And Chewbacca was uh, not on the list, and George Lucas approved that list, meaning saying that you can kill him off. He gave that approval. And... Mm -hmm. This sent the fandom in uproar. Oh, yeah. Understandably so. It's, it's a very critical choice. It's a very powerful scene. But it speaks, I think, a testament to what uh, literature can do when fans are so invested. And it's no surprise. It's no different. I don't feel that Star Wars fans are any different today than we were 20 years ago. We just, 20 years ago, we didn't have the YouTube like megaphone like, I hate this. <laughs> now we can scream and somebody in Cambodia will, will figure out what we're saying like 25 seconds later or like TikTok and somebody in China will know, oh, Benjamin over here hates New Jedi Order. You know, like that, now information spreads. But back then, I'm pretty sure fans, if they were given opportunity, would be just as vocal. Uh, oh, yeah. They sent, they sent R.A. Salvatore death threats in the mail. <laughs> are you serious? like how dare you kill chewbacca and i mean <laughs> i didn't know that, that oh yeah it was 
I'm honestly surprised that he came back to write um, the novelization of episode two, Attack of the Clones, because mm -hmm. he probably had the worst experience of any of the authors in the New Jedi Order series that just, there were fans that just could not accept what happened. And I mean, I understand being upset about what happens to a character, but like that never, that does not it, allow you to <laughs> behave like yeah. that. Yeah. Meg, uh, for our last couple of questions before we wrap up here, and guys, hopefully we'll schedule something soon and we'll continue this discussion with the new Jedi Order. Meg, I'm loving hearing you talk of the, and being so excited just as I am about new Jedi Order. And hopefully you guys who are listening, this will give you enough like a motivation to go and check those books out. They're completely wonderful. I don't think any Star Wars fans should be without Star Wars Legends. Don't mind the fact they're not, you know, canon anymore. Who cares? It's just all fantasy, whatever. Um, couple of things that I wanted to ask you. Uh, I couldn't skip on your favorite character of all time, Kip Duran. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about uh, what, where he is before Vector Prime in terms of your relationship with like, how you like him, how you interpret him. And how did you feel his little first experience, his introduction to the Vong, where his entire squadron of uh, Avengers gets decimated on Helska 4? Yeah, so Kipe or Kip, the official pronunciation I is Kip. I don't know. Is it Kip? But it, it is Kip, but like you, I read the books, did not know how to pronounce his name, and in my head he was Kipe. Cause Let's go with Kipe. Cool. So I like <laughs> Kipe. When we first meet him in the Jedi Academy trilogy, he's a young man who grew up in the spice mines of Kessel. He almost feels like a little brother role to Han that, you know, Han and Chewie are also imprisoned there. They're all able to escape together. He has this huge force potential, goes to the Luke Skywalker's Jedi Academy, but he also has all this anger towards the Imperials because they were, you know, what drove his family apart, sent them to the mines of Kessel. Yeah. His brother was taken away and forcibly made to be a stormtrooper. So he falls to the dark side. He blows up entire solar systems. Remind um, me, which book was that when he does it? Was it Jedi Academy Trilogy, the Sun Crusher episode? Yeah, yeah. Was like so, Jedi Academy Trilogy. Okay. Yeah, so at the end of Dark Apprentice, he takes off and he's stolen the Sun Crusher. Right, and then right. in Chief of the Force, <laughs> he, he basically shows up um at the imperial academy on carida and he's like give me my brother and they're like he's dead and he goes okay I've, I've blown up your son and then they're like oh shoot uh he's not dead and it's too late it's like yeah. a certain ball moment he can't get his brother in time so then he goes on a rampage and he blows up more and han saves him mm -hmm. and this was one part i didn't agree with um Basically, the only penance he had to do for blowing up entire solar systems was to have his own like cave a Dagobah experience and then yeah. help them dispose of the Sun Crusher. He got off easy a little bit. I, I'm there with you. Off easy. Mm. Um, and then what we see of him in subsequent books is he's trying to figure out how to be a Jedi and how to atone for what he did. Mm -hmm. And now as Vector Prime opens, he's definitely taken an antagonistic stance toward Luke. Luke is like, let's not take action, let's wait and see. And Kype is like, he's going around being a vigilante. He's like arresting smugglers. He's got his own squadron that yeah. he's called, um, uh, you know, Kype's Dozen and Two Avengers. But he's also one of the first people to encounter the Vuln in battle. You know, they, they at first aren't even aware that the Coral Skippers are ships. They just think they're asteroids. Asteroids, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so his entire, his apprentice, Miko Reglia, is captured by the Yuzin Vuln. And the other 12 pilots in his squadron are all killed. So he's the first one to get out and get word to them that there's something going on. And like at the back of his mind is the knowledge that he killed his own squadron that if they yeah. hadn't investigated this thing yeah. you know they wouldn't have been killed by the Vuln and Miko wouldn't have been captured and so it does seem like there is now a tension within Kite between he still wants to always take action and rush into action but also mm -hmm. 
you know, like the consequences of his actions yeah. are sitting there, you know. Yeah. You know, I felt I felt that uh, Ari Salvatore stayed very true to this character when he incorporated him from uh, Kevin J. Anderson, because there we see Kip's how that the minds of Cassells have have played into his psyche, what kind of like person they molded him into and his little just a position against Han Solo and why he would gravitate more towards Han Solo is rebel, this independent, cocky, you know, smuggler. Yeah. And <clears throat> they evolved this in this in these books. And and I felt that his antagonism towards Luke almost felt like a clash of generation. It wasn't coming out of malice or just that typical Jedi anger that turns into kind of like Anakin, the fallen Jedi goes completely Sith. It wasn't that. It wasn't. It was more of Kip the Wrong trying to challenge the old ways. Like, hey, yeah. Luke is doing this. Well, I'm going to do that. It was more kind of like a spirit of youth of trying to figure out where he belongs in this galaxy. And the Helska Four humbles him. And I felt like that was a pivotal point where he's still being Kip the Wrong. He can't help being Kip the Wrong. But I felt like it was interesting to follow his journey, even though parts of it frustrated me because he was well written because he was a good character because like well I, I hate kype over here but i do like what he's doing here he's on the right track here but how dare you do this again again it's it's not the kind of character that's necessarily likable but you can sympathize with him and that's why i asked you early in this podcast which books you would recommend fans read because it gives you context to yes. what this character origin is why is he the way that he is because you have to trust into what this author is doing was started by someone else. That's the whole beauty of Star Wars books. Um, anything else you wanted to add on Kip Duran before I, like, I, I launch our final question? Yeah, I just think Kip, he's so cocky. And, and you know, yeah. when you first meet him, he's like, you know, he's definitely, he thinks he's great. And I do get the sense with Luke that it's like this battle for dominance. That's sort of like, yeah, you've had the Jedi Order long enough, old man. Let's let's try some new things. But there's also that, like, not weakness, but there is, you know, a side to him that isn't cocky. It's just yeah. it puts up a really good front, and it will take a a number of books before we start to see more of like his inner feelings there's gentleness inside of him for sure there's that a uh, uh, glimpse of what we saw han solo in the solo movie where that, that there's this confident front but but yeah. behind it is like he's insecure he's navigating life is just as confusing and frustrating as for the rest of the teenagers you know of the galaxy meg uh we are coming to the conclusion to our first part of the new jedi order thank you so much for coming up and chatting with me. I love hearing you talk about it. I love the, the Force Ned and uh, Nagano art that we talked about. Uh, it's just so fun, and I hope we continue this, and I hope you guys will be enjoying it. And as we talk about this, please be my guiding hand. I'll try to do the like, brush up on my wiki reads, but it's been so long since I read these books. You Obviously, you will have the upper hand, and you'll have like all the details and know-how. My last question for today is, so... How did you feel by the time, you know, you close the final chapter, you close this book, where the Skywalker slash family ends by the end of this book? How did you make it feel? I felt like it definitely felt like a victory for now that, mm. you know, they defeated the Praetor at Vaughn. But obviously there's going to be more because Nominor's out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, Han's able to say farewell to Chewie in some way, but obviously that's not going to solve his problems or, or fix his feelings about it. And with the solo kids, I got the sense that, you know, this was their first really big battle they had been involved in that they, you know, found they have these abilities, you know, that they can like mind meld together but they'll have a lot to learn and so it's definitely like it, it was a good ending but it definitely felt like nothing is resolved here you know you're gonna have to keep reading to find out what happens next yeah i felt like you know that it's, uh it's a short-lived illusionary kind of like piece and uh 
the clouds are gathering. Obviously, you know, we didn't have the foresight. We didn't know where it's going to go. I had no idea how vast of a campaign the Vong will have upon this galaxy. But you could tell I was alarmed. I felt like, oh, it feels like the solo Skywalker family is once again fighting on the side of battle, which like we're small, we're insignificant, we're against the insurmountable odds, just like they were in the original trilogy with the Empire. Yeah. And it's something that I felt was a completely missed opportunity in the sequel trilogy, where they didn't present us with enough fearful opponent to raise the stakes. Because first of all, mm-hmm. just incompetent buffoons. Like even when they bark out <laughs> orders, it just felt so phony and goofy and stupid. It didn't feel right. Kylo Ren was never threatening. You know, the the, the CGI villain that is a uh, uh, um, what's his face? I forget his name. Uh, oh, Snoke. Uh, Snoke. It's it, it's. It, He's kind of interesting in in my favorite Disney era movie, you know, The Last Jedi. It kind of gave him a little bit of nuance. I'm like, bam, chop his head off. There was nothing in there to make you feel like, whoa, you know, this, this, the, 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 the rock is about to fall on me. What's going to happen next? That's how I closed the final chapter of this book. I was like, man, something, It it. I guess it made me feel uneasy. Yeah. Because I knew, I knew that the solo Skywalker family is not out of it. And I felt Han's pain in that, it, it's by the end of this book, right, where they go to the Kashyyyk to say proper goodbye to uh, Chewie, right? Oh, I think that's in Agents of Chaos, Heroes Trial. Right, There's right, like, right. I'm confusing my stories now. He says goodbye several times. <laughs> right. I, I, guess, I guess I'm linking it now. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But mm-hmm. that's why I finally got a piece of mind, a piece of conclusion. It's like, okay, maybe from this point forward, Han will begin his healing process. But like here, like you mentioned uh, earlier, nothing is resolved. Yeah. It's just starting. It's just beginning. Um, Meg, once again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope we have a, a good, solid year ahead of us. Uh, congratulate you on the 500 uh, uh, followers. I hope you get 25,000 more. You make some kick-ass Star Wars content. I love your reviews. Promise to watch a little bit more. I've been like kind of slacking off uh, lately. Please remind the uh, audience once again where they can find and watch your stuff. And what uh, uh, future releases can they look forward to? What's the video you're reviewing right now? Sure. So I am on YouTube as Meg Reviews, where I do, like I said, mainly reviews of the Legends books. But sometimes I do like the High Republic stuff or short video essays. I'm on Instagram as The Meg Reviews, where I mostly post pictures of me attempting to recreate the outfits on book covers. And I post my reviews on Goodreads as well. It's usually just the written version of my video reviews. And I'm reading some High Republic stuff right now. So I have the the manga and I got um, The Fallen Star by Claudia Gray, which I hope to have reviews soon. And then February will be when I start rereading the prequel stuff. And my first one will be the novelization of The Phantom Menace by Terry Brooks. Nice. I haven't read any of the Star Wars book novelizations. I'm going to do mm-hmm. it as well. Fans urge me to read the third one. They said Revenge of the yes. Sith is one of the most wonderful uh, uh, screen to book adaptations. I can't wait to read them. Well, anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate your time. Please support Meg's channel. Go say hi, hi you know, like her videos, subscribe. Do the same for me because uh, I hope my channel has been entertaining thus far. Hope to take it farther this year and provide you guys with lots more Star Wars entertainment. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care.